Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, and it's a great pleasure to share the podium with Felice. You, you know you've done well when you get to share a podium like this with one of your former students. So, <laughs> so the, uh, really, a lot of my achievements have lived through all the students I've trained, and Felice is a good example. Do I have to keep touching that? <laughs> Um, I'd like to take you back to around 1970. In 1970, <clears throat> migration was not a very hot topic. Uh, when uh, Charlie Westoff led a commission to write uh, 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 the report on population growth and the American future, I think it contained two paragraphs on immigration. Uh, in 1970, for the first and only time in American history, the foreign-born percentage fell below 5% and reached an all-time historical low of 4.7%. Europe, of course, was in the throes of massive guest worker migration, but they were perceived as a temporary phenomenon, guests, who were not going to structurally change European societies in any meaningful way. That all came to an end, of course. Uh, the 1970s was a transition period during which time immigration became a hot topic, an issue for uh, scholars uh, all over the developed world. Over the course of the 70s and 80s and 90s, each country, each developed country throughout the world became a labor importing society. Whether they admitted it to themselves or not is another question, but they all began to import labor. As European countries joined the European Union, Southern Europe in particular, Spain, Portugal, as they joined and became integrated, they flipped from being labor sending societies to being labor receiving societies. And over the course of the decades, uh, migration became a subject of vigorous scholarly investigation. So now I want to talk, take you back about 25 years ago, the late 1980s. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, Hein just pointed out, there was a lot of empirical work accumulating. And the empirical work was sometimes guided by theory, not always guided by theory, but when it was guided by theory, it was only guided by one theory. And there were lots of different theories out there. And uh, uh, around 1990, I was approached by the president of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, Massimo Livi Bacci. And he asked me to lead uh, an international committee of the IOSSP on South-North migration, whose charge was to review prevailing theories of migration, evaluate them relative to the empirical evidence, and create an integrated conceptual framework based on our theoretical review and empirical consideration. And uh, that produced uh, the, art the article that Hein mentioned in his introduction uh, with my international committee, Joaquin Arango, it was a Spanish sociologist, Graham Hugo, an Australian a geographer, Ali Kouachi, a demographically trained um, uh, scholar, received his PhD in Belgium but was from Algeria, Adela Pellegrino comes out of the um, historical structural tradition, and she is Uruguayan, and Ed Taylor is a, a, an economist. So it was multi, multiple continents, multiple disciplines, multiple fields, and we cast a wide net and uh, ultimately produced the first work we produced was the PDR article in 1993, which later uh, formed the basis for uh, a chapter in the book Worlds in Motion. Um, which is probably the IUSSP's leading seller of uh, works that it's produced. <clears throat> uh, it had a series of chapters. We reviewed the contemporary theories and then we used them uh, to guide uh, a review of work uh, across uh, the different migration systems that were prevailing in the late 1980s and early 1990s in North America, Europe, the Gulf, the Pacific, and South America. And then two chapters um, written largely by Ed Taylor, but with contributions from me um, on, uh, on migration and development. <clears throat> After the book was published, uh, almost immediately I realized there was a big hole 
in the theories that we considered, a big hole in the explanations that we had put forth. <clears throat> um, we'd reviewed uh, the neoclassical economic um, literature, uh, the micro and macro uh, explanations for, um, uh, for international migra for migration, the new economics of labor migration, segmented labor market theory, world systems theory, and social capital theory. But uh, even though we looked broadly at all these things, I think one key ingredient was missing, and that was the action of states and the need to theorize, to think about what states do in making migration policy. If you want to study the determinants of migration, in a very real way, you have to just study the determinants of state policy because uh, they shape, inevitably, the migration flows that are produced, and they change the quality, character, geographic distribution, size, volume of these flows. They often do it in ways that are completely unintended or even counterproductive, but state actions have big consequences for international flows around the world. So um, the year after we published the Worlds in Motion, I, I tried to survey the literature on migration policy and looked at the role of the state in an article published again in Population and Development Review. <clears throat> Basically, um, according to the theoretical and empirical literature at that time, uh, it seemed that um, uh, the, there were several foundations of immigration policy in receiving societies. Uh, macroeconomic conditions, of course, during recessionary periods, uh, there was a move towards restriction towards, and during boom periods, a move towards more open immigration policy. And uh, several studies indicated and, uh, during recessionary periods, the key variable was inequality in wages that really seemed to push societies towards uh, restriction. Uh, then, of course, the scale and nature of immigration itself, uh, how large the flows were, uh, and how different they were from the society into which they were proceeding. Uh, ideology plays a role. Neoliberalism um, tends to promote uh, free trade and openness. Uh, populism and nationalism promote restriction. And, of course, uh, at the time, in the... Um, uh, late 1980s, we were just at the very end of the Cold War, and the Cold War had played a really important part in structuring migration flows around the world. <clears throat> uh, state capacity, and, and then finally I took a look at state capacity. Uh, 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 a, a country may imp impose a policy, whether it can actually enforce that policy and make it work in an intended fashion is a whole other question. And uh, talked about state capacity in terms of the strength of the bureaucracy, uh, the demand for entry, how many people they're actually ha having to deal with who want to come, um, the strength of protections for human rights, the degree to which migrants can access uh, the judiciary uh, and, and the independence of the judiciary to uh, adjudicate uh, rights for migrants, and of course uh, the cultural tr tradition of immigration. Uh, the United States and Canada, of course, are immigrant receiving societies. We don't debate about whether we are. We talk about what kind of immigrants and, and how many, but um, our identity is a, an immigrant receiving society, which is very different from a place like Japan, which has a, a very insular culture that uh, sees J Japanese-ness as almost a genetic characteristic and, and finds it very hard to think of anybody else becoming Japanese from outside, whereas uh, immigrants coming into the United States have always become uh, Americans. So um, I want to talk about uh, how state actions have played out in practice and then think about the theoretical implications of what's happened in, pra in, in practice by looking at the case that, of course, I know best and the one that I've devoted most of my career to studying, and that's Latin American migration to the United States from 1965 to 2010. Over this period, uh, I argue, uh, a critical determinant of the volume, pattern, and distribution of immigration has been state policy not the social and economic fundamentals that underlie the migration flows. Uh, uh, these give rise to migration, but the form that it takes, the shape that it, it emerges, <coughs> the geographic distribution, the size, the volume, the character, the net rate, all those things were determined by state actions. Uh, typically, they were implemented with no real understanding of the underlying dynamics of immigration, and often for reasons having little to do with immigration itself. 
and they almost always produced unexpected and very frequently counterproductive consequences. It took me a long time in the field to realize that people in Congress make immigration policy with no idea what they're doing about immigration. And the policy is made not with any thought about immigration, but really with thoughts about domestic political issues, mobil political mobilizations domestically that are only tangentially related to the actual flow of immigrants coming into the country. And I'll illustrate this. So now I'll take you back to 1965. I keep going back in history because I can pass off as erudition what's really memory for me. Uh, <coughs> um, in 1965, uh, when I was 13 years old, um, the US uh, made uh, several, two fateful policy decisions in 1965 that had huge effects and really set in motion a path dependency that would transform the North American migration system. Uh, in 1965, the U.S. Congress uh, uh, passed amendments to the Immigration and Nationality Act. And in the same year, they unilaterally terminated, failed to extend beyond 1964, the, uh, a large guest worker program that had lived on for 22 years, uh, known as the Bracero Program. These two decisions had little effect on the number of immigrants from Mexico, uh, but uh, they had huge effects on the status in which they entered. So in 1965, uh, for very laudable reasons, uh, Congress sought to amend U.S. immigration law. And the laudable reasons were they wanted to eliminate racism from the immigration system. The Immigration and Nationality Act contained quotas that were implemented first in the 1920s and designed to keep out those undesirable uh, Jews and Catholics from Eastern and Southern Europe. Uh, and by 1965, the United States was in the throes of the civil rights movement. And these anti, uh, these prejudicial discriminatory quotas came to be seen as intolerably racist. And the act, the, uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act, basically barred Asian f migration from Asia and Africa. So these things were seen as racism, and, and they were. And so uh, amendments were posed to the Immigration and Nationality Act, not as an act of immigration policy, but as an act of civil rights policy in the United States. And instead of discriminatory quotas and bans, it created a new system uh, where people got into the United States through family reunif reunification criteria and labor needs. Um, but it also imposed a new system of quotas around the world, not on the basis of discrimination, but on the basis of a perceived equality where each country around the world would get about 20,000 visas uh, that were numerically limited and capped at about 290,000 for the entire uh, world. This was implemented in phases. So uh, the, um, the caps weren't imposed until 1968. And initially, uh, the country quotas only applied to what in our own ethnocentric way in the United States we call the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, uh, and that's basically everything but the Americas. And the Americas, for the first time in history, uh, had a cap on the number of immigrants who could enter. So everybody, a lot of people say, oh, the 1965 Immigration Act produced all these new immigrants from Latin America. That's not true. Uh, in fact, the 1965 amendments imposed the first ever limits on uh, immigration from Latin America to the United States. And um, uh, the country quotas were not implemented in the Western Hemisphere until 1976. Uh, and in 1976, uh, the, uh, uh, by 1976, the entire world had been placed under country quotas of 20,000 visas per year and a worldwide cap of about 290,000. Uh, the other thing that happened was they canceled the Bracero program. The Bracero program, at its height in the late 1950s, was bringing in about 450,000 Mexican workers per year on temporary visas for short-term work in the United States. And at the same time, uh, about 50,000 Mexicans were entering on permanent resident visas, which were numerically unlimited. So in de facto terms, uh, you go from the late 1950s to the late 1970s from uh, an immigration uh, system, law, of law, that permitted a, a flow of about half a million Mexicans into the United States in the late 1950s under legal auspices, 
to a new system where there are only 20,000 20, permanent resident visas and uh, no guest worker program. But, of course, the economic realities on both sides of the borders had not changed. Supply and demand were still there. Uh, and, in fact, after 22 years of Bracero migration, huge networks had formed to connect people in Mexico with employers and communities all over the United States. And so, basically, once the uh, doors to legal entry were slammed shut after 1965, uh, the flow simply resumed under undocumented auspices. And there was a shift from legal to unauthorized migration. The numbers did not change very much. And initially, the pattern of migration did not change very much. Basically, pre-1965, you had a large system under which up to half a million Mexicans would enter the United States and 90% would be on temporary visas. And it was a hugely circular system. Even permanent legal residents used their green cards as circulation documents to in large numbers at this time. Estimates show very high rates of return migration among legal immigrants. Uh, and then after 1965, uh, basically when the uh, opportunities for legal immigration were over, the circulation simply continued, except now it was all, it was 90% unauthorized rather than authorized. And you can see this in the data, what we have here. Uh, the, we have three, uh, Mexican immigration in the United States in three categories, legal, temporary, temporary but legal, and illegal. And so you see that um, the Bracero program and legal immigration, Bracero was about 450,000, legal fluctuating around 50,000, virtually no uh, undocumented migration at that time. And then you cut off suddenly the, the opportunities for legal entry in 1965, uh, uh, and over the next decade or so, um, uh, basically, the flows resume under undocumented auspices, which peak around the late 1970s and then begin to fluctuate uh, in tandem with social, changing social and economic conditions on both sides of the border. But uh, the uh, illegal flows are no longer growing by around 79 or 1980. Uh, legal immigration um, uh, 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 slowly uh, increases. And, um, and temporary migration um, only begins to revive again uh, in the um, late 1970s, early 1980s. So essentially, the United States through its policies, through its civil rights policies, and the cancellation of the Bracero program was seen in the context of the civil rights movement. It was canceling an exploitative labor program that was on a par with Southern sharecropping, just like, uh, so we got rid of sharecropping for African Americans, we got rid of the Bracero program uh, for uh, the burgeoning Chicano movements who uh, were trying to organize under Cesar Chavez, organize the farm workers and so on. So this was all civil rights policy, not immigration policy. And so basically we transformed a, what had been a legal flow of half a million workers from Mexico to the United States. Uh, 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 in, in, who were legal uh, uh, into a, a similarly sized flow, except now the vast majority were undocumented. Second faithful decision was America's Cold War intervention in Central America. Uh, the United States uh, uh, responded uh, in a very vigorous and aggressive way after the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua in 1979. The Sandinista <coughs> Sandinistas were uh, a leftist ideology uh, that deposed uh, a, um, uh, a dictator in Nicaragua, Anastasio, Anastasio, Anastasio Somoza, who was uh, 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 an American ally, American, basically an American puppet. Uh, Lyndon Johnson once said of him, uh, I know he's an asshole, but he's our asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, the Sandinistas deposed him in 1979 and began to shift uh, uh, leftward, impose a, a socialist regime, receiving support from the Soviet Union. And of course, in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president and assuming the office in early 1981, began to prosecute the Cold War in Central America, ultimately organizing and funding and armed into insurrection against the Sandinistas, known as the Contra Army, and, uh, and providing military political support 
uh, through open and, uh, and closed channels uh, uh, to right-wing governments in Guatemala, Salvador, and Honduras to, for them to suppress uh, leftist insurgencies and to use these countries as staging grounds to attack the Sandinistas. Uh, the U.S. intervention, of course, produced a surge of refugees from Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Honduras. And Nicaraguans, and here's the Cold War, Nicaraguans fleeing a left-wing government like the Sandinistas were, of course, welcomed as refugees from communist tyranny. And under the Nic uh, NACARA Act, the Nicaraguan Adjustment and Central American Relief Act, uh, uh, were granted uh, a red carpet to permanent resident status. No matter how they entered, they were forgiven for their undocumented entry and allowed to adjust status to become legal permanent residents. But uh, Guatemalans, Salvadorans, and, and Hondurans had the misfortune of fleeing right-wing governments allied with the United States, so they couldn't possibly be political refugees. They were labeled ec economic refugees and therefore ineligible for any refugee or asylum policy and, and excluded from uh, a permanent residence. And uh, as a result, most entered in um, uh, undocumented status. A, a, few, a few were given, uh, given kind of a temporary status, uh, uh, temporary protected status, TPS, uh, but nobody, very few were able to achieve uh, a, a full-fledged permanent residence in the United States. So two U.S. actions really affected the flow and of migrants in from Latin America to the United States and produced, manufactured, huge undocumented populations living north of the border. Um, you see here, this is uh, an indicator of, of violence that I, I constructed. You can't get good statistics, but I went to ProQuest historical newspapers and searched on war, killing, death, and n the name of each of these countries and came up with a frequency of these mentions. And you see that um, prior to the Sandinistas in the late 1970s, these words were not used in conjunction with these, co in conjunction with these countries. So then there's a huge surge during the 1980s, which drops down rapidly in the 1990s after the peace accords. So this I use as an indicator of the depth of the US um, in models, I've used as an indicator of the depth of the U.S. intervention in uh, Central America and the violence that it produced. Um, this is the probability of taking a first undocumented trip to the United States from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua using data that we collected in, use, through the Latin American Migration Project in those countries from uh, surveys we've done in those countries. So you see it doesn't correspond completely, but it really shows the increase during the 1980s and 1990s. So not surprisingly, this is the composition of the undocumented population. So Two-thirds Mexican and Central American. And the other uh, is not dominated by any single population. So what you 62% are Mexican and 14% are Central American. The next biggest uh, uh, contributor is China at 2%, India at 2%, <coughs> and then everything else is 1% or less. So, Basically, the undocumented population is a Latin American population, and it was created by U.S. policies. The fact that all these migrants were undocumented created a new political dynamic in the United States. It enabled political uh, activists and bureaucratic entrepreneurs to frame Latino immigration and Latino immigrants as a crisis favoring two metaphors, the flood metaphor and the invasion metaphor. So the flood metaphor, uh, uh, undocumented migration was a flood tide that was going to uh, uh, s sweep over the country, drown American culture, and ind inundate American society. Uh, over time, the favored, metaphor be the favored metaphors became martial <coughs> metaphors. The undocumented migration was an alien invasion of the United States. Uh, in which uh, uh, in, a, aliens were uh, uh, attacking the border that was defended by um, border patrol officers who were seeking to hold the line. That's, that's an official name of a policy of the border patrol, seeking to hold the line against the uh, bonsai charges, and this, they use that too, bonsai charges of undocumented se sweeping into the country uh, seeking to uh, take over the United States. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and since my, uh, illegal migrants were by definition illegal, they were 
They were also, by definition, criminals and lawbreakers and easily framed as a, as a, as a threat to the United States and freely conflated during the Cold War with communists and Cold War subversives and freely conflated later on during the War on Terror with terrorists and terrorist threats. So you see, they're not looking at illegal migration for what it is, a product of U.S. policies, simply, uh, in the case of Mexico, a circular labor flow, in the case of Central America, refugees created by our own actions. No, they became tools, props, in rhetoric about the Cold War and the War on Terror, and a way for politicians to mobilize constituencies domestically and mobilize resources for the bureaucracy to uh, uh, enhance their political and bureaucratic careers. Immigrants were, uh, became uh, subversive, criminals, terrorists, invaders, occupiers. And this led to the rise of what Leo Chavez at uh, University of California, Irvine, has called the Latino threat nar narrative. He coded US magazine covers in Time, Newsweek, and US World Report. We used to have three news, news magazines. We no longer have uh, three. We only have Time now, and it's a pale shell of what it used to be. Uh, <clears throat> And, and so he coded them about uh, whether they were alarmist or not. And you can see the frequency of alarmist codings rises steadily from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. Uh, and I've already told you about the uh, metaphors that are used, the marine metaphor and the martial metaphor, and over time a gradual shift from marine to martial metaphors. Uh, and here um, is something I did, again using ProQuest uh, newspaper codings, where we uh, coded up the frequency of mentions of immigration as a crisis, flood, or invasion in leading U.S. newspapers, and then did a three-year moving average. And you can see that uh, in 1965, you never heard these terms in American news media with respect to immigration. And then their frequency increases uh, basically in tandem with the rise of undocumented migration, the restoration of the flows under undocumented auspices. And like undocumented mi the flow of undocumented migration peaks around 1979, 1980, and then begins to fluctuate with economic and uh, 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 other issues. And this uh, produced uh, a feedback. So you have illegal entries driving up apprehensions uh, after 1965. But then the apprehensions uh, changed the political rhetoric and brought around uh, a new conservatism uh, in the United States. Uh, and, and, and this new conservatism actually produced more restrictive legislation and produced more restrictive border operations. Uh, and those increased the number of Border Patrol agents and the size of the Border Patrol's budget, which generated more line watch hours. That's the number of hours spent patrolling the border, uh, which in turn produced um, uh, more undocumented migration. So um, basically, there we are. this was the exogenous factor that was actually created by US policy, uh, drove up apprehensions. Apprehensions became self-evident proof of the ongoing invasion that was occurring, driving a conservative reaction <coughs> which ultimately produced more line watch hours. And then once this dynamic got going, illegal entries stops growing in 1979, but this feedback loop, it becomes ever more powerful. So more line watch hours, more apprehensions, more apprehensions prove the, the invasion's not being checked, we need more line watch hours, so more restrictive legislation, more operations, more line watch hours, and, and it just goes like this. And uh, e even though, so um, this, this is basically the, our estimate of the volume of undocumented migration, and this is the number of apprehensions. And those apprehensions build to a peak in 1986, when the U.S. really launches what proved to be a two-decade militarization of the Mexico-U.S. border uh, with the passage of the Immigration Reform Control Act, fondly known as IRCA. I'm running out of time already. Okay, so um, this is the predicted probability of taking a, f a first undocumented trip to the United States just using the violence indicator and then uh, the red line shows uh, violence plus social capital indicators. So what happened was um, when the violence ended, you didn't go back to the status quo ante because all these people came to the United States and they were connected to people back home in Central America, and that drives the flows now. And that's what you see at the border right now, the residual of our 
uh, blowback residual from what we did in the 1980s with the sons and daughters of the people who migrated out as refugees in the 80s seeking to reunite with their families. So this gives you some idea of the rhetoric. Um, Ronald Reagan in 1985 said terrorists and subversives are just two days driving time from the border and communist agents will feed on the frustration of recent Central American and South American immigrants who will not realize their own version of the American dream. And then there's Sam Huntington's um, famous uh, uh, talk about the Latino challenge, uh, Lou Dobbs specifically calling it an invasion on the war on a daily basis, Patrick Buchanan alleging there's an Aztlan plot hatched by Mexican elites seeking to recapture lost lands. And this is in the news, I just got this from the newspaper, Texas Governor Rick Perry, it's a very real possibility that individuals with extremist group ISIS may have crossed the United States from the southern border. And individuals from ISIS or other terrorist states could be taking advantage of the situation. I think it's a very real possibility they may have already used the border for entry. This was last week. Jeff Duncan of South Carolina, wake up America, Mr. Duncan said before storming out of a congressional hearing. With a porous southern border, we have no idea who's in our country. Scare tactics, mobilization political mobilization. This is not about Mexican immigration. This is not about Latins coming to the United States. It's about our own fears and apprehensions being projected onto the border, and the border and immigrants simply become props. So uh, Renato Rosaldo said, the <clears throat> in theory, this is his theoretical um, argument, the Mexican U.S. borders become a theater, and border theaters become social violence. Actual violence has become inseparable from symbolic ritual all on the border, crossings, invasions, lines of defense, high-tech surveillance, and more. In practice, this is a representative uh, from Texas, Beto O'Rourke uh, from El Paso, Texas, simply notes that there's a long-standing history in the country of projecting whatever fears we have onto the border. In, their absence of un in the absence of understanding of the border, they insert their fears. Before it was Iran and Al-Qaeda, now it's ISIS. They just reached the conclusion that invasion is imminent and it never is. That's also a quote from last week. <clears throat> so the terrorist the war on terror generated its own dynamic that pushed forward deportations to also enhance the conservative reaction. This just gives you, I'm, I'm not making, just to show you I'm not making this stuff up, this is the increasing pace of anti-immigrant le legislation that's passed over the, uh, since 1965. And these are the restrictive border operations that began to be launched in 1993. Um, I, I, I just, I love some of the titles. Uh, Operation Streamline, Operation Return to Sender, Operation Rapid Repat. Um, uh, uh, all, all these military style things. And again, this has nothing to do with, with the realities of immigration. This is all about domestic politics. And, and this is what you end up with. This is you standing on a hill. The Pacific Ocean is at your back. To your right is Tijuana. To the left is San, the lower part of San Diego County. And um, just to give you a, a comparison, this is the Korean DMZ. Uh, this shows you the militarization of the border from 1986 to 2010. In real terms, this is the Border Patrol's budget in 2013 dollars, growing exponentially beginning in 1986, accelerating in the 1990s, and booming after 2001. So uh, I know I'm out of time, but what I'm going to do now is show you causal estimates of how the militarization of the border affected uh, the process, the pattern of migration from Mexico to the United States. Uh, I basically use data from the Mexican Migration Project combined with statistics and um, and um, use indicators of the U.S. context. The key indicator here is uh, the log of a Border Patrol budget instrument. So we instrumented the Border Patrol's budget using the DEA budget. The DEA budget responds to the war on, on drugs uh, in the United States. It's a very different dynamic, but it's correlated in, in time with the budget of, of the uh, war on immigrants, which is a whole other thing, and uh, it, it makes a very good instrument. And so we use an instrumental variable for the Border Patrol budget. We also control for all those things on the on what you see on the right-hand side, and we take into account the economic fundamentals in Mexico and the United States. So 
This is the observed probability of crossing at a traditional location, that is, either El Paso or San Diego. And you see the observed, the solid line, and what would be predicted if you hold everything else constant and just vary the Border Patrol budget. So the Border Patrol budget pushed crossings away from California, particularly, into the Sonoran Desert through Arizona and transformed the geography of border crossing and transformed uh, the geography of settlement in the United States, basically turning it into a 50-state phenomenon. Uh, you make, the, make it difficult and more risky to cross the border. You push people towards the universal adaptation, ad adoption of coyotes for crossing. So it was always high, but over time, the Border Patrol budget increase pushed it up to a universality. Everybody crosses now with a, a, a paid border smuggler known as a coyote. Uh, and um, you also drove up the costs of coyotes. This is uh, predicted and observed the cost of border smuggling. <clears throat> and um, this shows you what the effect that um, uh, the um, Border Patrol's budget increase had on um, the probability of apprehension at the border. So you see the solid line is the observed probability of apprehension, and the dashed line is the predicted probability of apprehension. And it, you know, it had some minor modest effect, but really didn't change the probability of getting caught. And the, and the line at the top is the probability of getting in uh, over a series of attempts. So um, up through the 2005, 97 to 100% of the people eventually got in over a number of attempts. And uh, it drove up deaths at the border. This is a regression, regressing the number of deaths at the border on the Border Patrol's budget. This is all instrumental variables, so this is an estimate of the causal effect of the border militarization. And this is the kicker. This is the um, um, uh, uh, predicted probability of um, uh, undocumented migration on the likelihood of taking a first undocumented trip. So you see the, the um, the solid line goes up and down, uh, but the overall trend is downward. Uh, uh, and, and illegal migration is now basically zero in, from Mexico to the United States. Uh, and the, the dashed line is what you would pre predict from the Border Patrol's budget. So the Border Patrol budget had no effect on determining the likelihood somebody would leave to come into the United States without documents. The, dash, the, the dotted line, interestingly, is what you predict from the average age of people eligible to migrate. And you see that um, basically the end of undocumented migration was already built into the demography of Mexico because of the demographic transition. Uh, Mexico's fertility rate went from about seven children per woman in 1960 to currently 2.3 children per woman. And the demographic transition in Mexico has changed uh, the demographic basis of immigration and made uh, basically ended illegal migration. <clears throat> and this puts it all together. So um, this shows you the demographic transition in Mexico. This is the population growth rate in Mexico by decade. And these show you population pyramids, 1990, uh, then to the next one to the right is 2000. You see today, 2010, uh, you see that um, the labor force it's becoming an aging society, and labor force growth is decelerating. But did, uh, uh, the border militarization did have one profound effect, and that was it reduced the rate of return migration. Once they'd paid the costs and experienced the risks, they stayed in the United States. So basically, the consequences of the war on immigrants, the, from 1986 to 2010, the U.S. spent $35 billion in border for enforcement, and in doing so, they transformed what had been a circular flow of male workers going to three states into a settled population of families living in 50 states. They reduced out-migration while leaving in-migration unchanged to double the net rate of undocumented migration and population growth. They created a population of 11 million undocumented U.S. residents, 60% of whom are Mexicans and two-thirds of all, who, and another two-thirds with Central Americans is two-thirds, all while attempting to end an undocumented flow that would have ended of its own accord after 2000 because of the demographic transition. And now mass illegality has become a characteristic feature of the Latino population of the United States. So this is the percent undocumented among selected immigrant groups. 
You see, it's a large majority of uh, Mexicans, Hondurans, and Guatemalans, and a, a simple majority of El Salvadorans. It, mass illegality uh, is a, become the single most uh, salient barrier to the progress and uh, mobility of uh, Latino immigrants in the United States. Lessons learned. Immigration policies often made without any regard to the realities of immigration. Initially, the changes to the uh, immigration policy were civil rights policy. And then when they created the undocumented flows, that became part of a Latino threat narrative that fed into the Cold War and later into the War on Terror uh, for domestic political purposes. Immigration policy can have a powerful effect on patterns and processes of immigration, dramatically, in this case, changing the patterns of departure and return, and dramatically uh, affecting conditions at the border, and dramatically changing the geography of entry and settlement. And these effects are often unexpected and unattended. Uh, we move uh, a circular flow to permanent settlement and increase the rate of undocumented population growth, and we produce a rapid Latinization of the U.S. population. So if you are a racist and you wanted to keep immigrants out, you actually had a counterproductive policy that boosted undocumented population. So the future of migration theory, I think you need to incorporate state behavior into theories of migration, recognize important role played in the migration flows by the demographic transition, uh, not as a direct uh, factor, but as a contextual factor, and uh, uh, understand the limitations of current and social and economic series. And uh, I give a shout out to Matthias Scheike. Uh, I like his paper very much on, on migration and economic prospects, using prospect theory uh, to uh, analyze migration, which I think has a, a lot of potential. Prospect theory, of course, is what won Danny Kahneman, the Nobel Prize in economics, basically behavioral economics, neuroeconomics, and, and, uh, and prospect theory uh, led by people like uh, Dan, Danny Kahneman and his, and his uh, disciples are showing that the foundations of the neoclassical model are resting on a bed of sand and crumbling. Uh, and so it's an attempt to, rather than, let's assume people are rational and have full information and markets are perfect and well-functioning and see what the world like, what looks like to, let's understand how people actually think cognitively and then try to build theoretical models around that to see what the world would look like instead of building a fantasy based on neoclassical assumptions.